We are early February and man, snow is melting fast. It's crazy. It's crazy. I'm just walking along this brook that I have that is a the main one of the main water draws on this property. I've got it crossing this road a couple of times only because the people who built this driveway when I bought before I bought this property, I had built it so that it crossed a water uh draw twice, which is pointless. You could have just put the driveway around it, but they didn't, and that's okay, lesson learned. But I just wanted to talk about this winter and how it's kind of crazy and how uh, it could mean a pretty dangerous fire season, potentially. And I want to talk about why that is, how that is, and what the solution is for some of us who are living out here. Because, hey, let's face it, folks, you want to live out in the country now, you're on your own. You got to be prepared to be on your own. The uh, powers that ought not to be want you hacked, tracked, stacked, and packed in a city. They want you eating bugs. They want you taking shots and uh, participating in urban degeneracy. <laughs> but that's not what we're doing out here. But they want to throttle you and get you off the land. And so if you're going to be on the land, you got to be prepared to live with the consequences and the responsibilities of that. And one thing that is very concerning for me going into uh, the summer here is the fact that my snow is melting and it's early February. That is, it's an El Nino winter, right? It's not, it's not like it's never happened before. And, but who knows? I mean, with all the geoengineering these days, who actually really knows? Um, but when you look at all the hype we had last year about wildfire season and a lot of the blatant fire starting something 90 percent of the fires started across alberta last year were human caused not climate change <laughs> however you know climate changing can uh, affect things climates change and there's a variety of reasons why a climate can change one of them could be an el nino winter which is apparently what we have but this could be concerning for us because the snow melt is very important and uh, it, it, it's a critical part of the boreal climate region that I'm in, that I live in, that pretty much stretches across most of Canada and much of the nor northern United States. The boreal forests, the softwood forests, the boreal climate is hot and dry in the summer and cold and wet in the winter. But that wetness comes in the form of snow for the most part, though this year we've had a lot of precipitation because of the lack of snow and even right now I've got a short break where it's not raining it's been raining for about a week solid and I'll do another video very soon about what's going on with my ponds because that's super exciting and I'm, I'm finally benefiting from the earthworks that I did last uh, summer and fall building of two ponds the catchment pond down below here and the reservoir pond which I'm pumping water to right now and those ponds are a big part of my fire strategy. They're actually the primary reason for my fire strategy. Because, again, if you're going to live out in the country and you're going to live off the grid, out of the way, you've got to take responsibilities for things. And that's just how it is. Cities, for all of their, um, for all of their negative effects, also have some benefit, right? It's convenient. Things are provided for you. You come home and you turn things on and, and they work and uh, you expect resources to be there and they are there, but you have no agency over them. So they're also risky in that way. And so one of the things that we have to really take uh, responsibility for up here in the country is fire. And that's why these ponds that I'm building are so important because the snow melt, the snow pack, as they call it as well, is very important for keeping the water flowing down, right? And so if you're familiar with the hydrologic cycle, the way it works is that precipitation comes in from the ocean and gets pushed into the mountains. And then it it lands as snow or precipitation in the mountains, and then it all just drains down back to the ocean eventually. That's how it all works. But when we have snow that melts too early, it means that the rivers dry up earlier, which means that the forests are just drier earlier, which means that we potentially have a longer potential fire season, which is which is a serious risk and a serious consideration. 
And so the one of the great things one can do on their property if they have the means and the ability to do it is build ponds and infrastructure that holds water, retains water, or slows the flow of water so that you're keeping water on your landscape. And that's what I'm able to do right now, which is really exciting because the water is all moving away. And this culvert here, this one is, is the spillway from my pond. And I'll do another video showing more of this specifically. But this is what's overflowing as all the snow is melting on this watershed above me is coming through and passing through that pond. But right now I'm pumping that catchment pond uphill into a bigger reservoir. And so what I'm hoping is going to happen soon is, and I'll, I'll, I'll do another video on this soon, but the water that's flowing out of here, which is from the spillway of that pond, is going to slow down, meaning that I'm holding more of it than I'm letting go. And of course you want to let some stuff go. But what snow does essentially is the same thing in time in that as long if there was snow if there was still three feet of snow on the ground which there there was two weeks ago <laughs> literally three feet of settled snow we get 120 accumulated inches on average of snow here in this climate a, 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 per winter and so there should still be a ton of snow on the ground and that snow would sit until it melted and then it would start to make its way down this isn't what's happening right ha now this is what it looked like last april i'm not kidding you maybe end of March. Last April, there was a little bit less snow, but there was still mostly gone. Um, and so what I can do in a way to cheat the fact that the snow is all melting and the water is all moving away is that I can hold it up here for longer. And there's a number of ways to do that. One of the best ways is the ponds, like I've just described, and you've seen in other videos, and I'll go into more detail in another one here soon. And... Uh, terraces and features on the property that also either hold or slow the flow of water. And so in my case, um, the holding of water is all done in the ponds. My soil on this property is very brittle. My soil on this property is very brittle. And that means that it doesn't have a lot of organic matter. Typically, I'm building that up and changing that. But by by what was here when i bought this place because this was just a clear cut all this was a, this was a cut block this was logged 40 50 years ago and uh so they they just took the trees out and didn't leave anything on the soil and so you know clear cutting is actually far more responsible for flooding as the environmentalists like to call it climate change but clear cutting is actually the thing that's more literally responsible for flooding of the riverways and flooding of the deltas and things like this is that when you clear cut the snow melts a lot faster than it does in the trees and just all you have to do is walk into the forest in the winter and see how much snow is on the ground opposed to in the open areas that's where flash flooding comes from is mismanaged forest and you can thank the government for that particularly in canada the ministry of forests they uh and i worked for them for many years as a tree planter they're just bureaucratic idiots for the most part who make decisions that make the most sense for the bottom line which is money and profit and most uh clear cutting and tree planting as well is done for profit so it's not about preserving the ecological uh foundation of what was there before though they're getting better at it and there's certain types of logging that are better than others selective logging being one of them far better than clear cutting but by and large the commercialization of the forests and the, the clear cutting and then the replanting of species that are just monoculture. And you see this all the time. And it's, it, in my opinion, it's a big reason why we have problems like pine beetle is because for many, many years, the uh, government, the Ministry of Forests would give the okay to go and clear cut a forest that was probably Douglas fir, spruce, pine cedar hemlock even a variety of trees and then they just go and plant straight lodgepole pine and then they create a monoculture and nature doesn't like monocultures and so we get problems in the forest but fundamentally the problem with flooding is the clear cutting and and and, and it's also the it's also the reason that we don't keep water in the watersheds 
is that if you clear cut areas that are watersheds, the snow melts five times faster, 10 times faster, even it's, 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 it's day and night. And so that's something that we have to deal with. If you're off grid living in the boreal climate, you need to find ways to hold on to water. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's a, the, the main features I have are that are, are the ponds, but the other features I have are, I can collect all the rainwater off my roof and I'll eventually divert that back into my pond, though I haven't finished how that's going to look yet. There's a cistern down below on this house here. Actually, I'll go over there and show it to you. And uh, it's just really simply set up right now. But that that cistern uh, will be bigger eventually. And I'll probably have a, a few of them. And they'll be underground cisterns. And they will, there'll be a, a float switch in there. It's a bit snowy here because I kept pushing snow off of the bank. But right down there, you can see that cistern. That's catching all the water from these two buildings. Actually, not on the face. I haven't connected it to it yet. But it's connecting most of it. And this thing fills up fast. This That's a 2,000 liter cistern. That'll fill up in a few hours of good rain. And what I'm going to do eventually is tie that system of water that's down there. It'll be tied back into the house. So it'll be a backup water source that if I can't pump water from my deep well, I can go and manually pump water from there, which I could also fill that up from my well. I could fill it up from my pond. And all of these things will connect eventually. And it's part of a greater decentralized water supply and fire suppression strategy that I have on the homestead here. And a lot of it's already done because I have main lines that connect all these features. I can send water from my deep drilled well that's right there and it goes eight feet underground to a pitless adapter and comes underground right into the back of the house here and once that's all finished that'll all be winterized and i'll be able to pull water from that well all winter no problem and then during the growing season when my pipes won't freeze outside i can move water any which way i could move water from that well to the ponds to my cisterns up the hill into the house, of course, and in any other combination, I'll be able to send water into these main lines. So one thing I'm going to be doing this spring, summer, big, big plan of mine is to, you see my fence line here, this fence, this fence encompasses the main open area of my homestead. When you see that drone shot that comes over the homestead, that's the main area we live in. It's eight acres. Our property is far bigger than that, but that's the area that we is you know 99% of our time is spent in there it's fenced to keep bears out and um, it's also the main area that I want to protect so I'm going to be running another prime 100 one and a quarter inch line as thick as this all around that fence and then that fence will also have lines that connect to each pond so the idea is that if it was hell on earth and it was an absolute crazy fire situation and I had fire coming on different fronts I could essentially pump water from my well and my ponds all at the same time and push water into that line to send water all over the place because just pumping water from my well I'm limited by the 10 gallons per minute that I have but I also have multiple gas powered pumps that I could essentially go and pump water from the ponds to get more water into that line to a point where you could have say 50 gpm coming out instead of 10 and then be able to send water all over the place. So I'm going to be putting sprinklers all around there. And I'm also going to be doing a lot of thin, uh, thinning of the forest. Going in and taking down a lot of the, the scrub, the brush. This, this little uh, uh, grove of forest of trees is nice. I like that. Though I could thin it out even more if I wanted to. But it's kind of clean. Whereas if you go into my forest, especially beyond the fence line, it's just scrubby. It's messy. And it's, it's a lot of brittle stuff there and it's dangerous. And so what, what we need to do on these types of homesteads is always just be thinning that stuff out. And it's, it's a real win-win. It's a win-win-win, really. One, it's great exercise. It's fun to do. It's, it's, it's good work. Two, it's good for the forest because it thins things out and gives space to some trees that, that need it in limited light. So it actually benefits the ecology of the forest. And three, you get firewood out of it. And that's why I bought a property that has, I've got about 30 acres of timber here. That's all just Douglas fir and pine. Some cedar and some spruce, but mostly Douglas fir and some larch actually. And uh, 
thinning that stuff out over the years, getting myself firewood, but also building up the resiliency of the area that we live in. And uh, so it's a multifold strategy. Water is just one part of it, but it is a very important part. So anyways, some food for thought there, folks. I thought I'd just share that with you guys. Also just wanted to say, I'm going to be at Anarco Poco in Acapulco, Mexico with my buddy Jeff Berwick and the whole Dollar Vigilante crew. I've uh, been invited to that conference for many years and I just haven't been able to make it. And an opening came up and uh, and I'm going to be coming down. So it's short notice, but uh, I'll be there. A lot of other really great speakers down there. If you're interested in checking it out, there's also an online event. There'll be a link in the show notes here. Discount code is CURTIS in all caps. That'll get you 10% off. And uh, will also give me a little kickback to support the trip down there. So I know it's short notice, but maybe I'll see some of you guys down there. I mean, I made the decision just a couple days ago and uh, said, let's just do it. So you might be in a position where you can do that too. And it'd be a lot of fun. These conferences are, it's all about the networking. For me, I used to go to conferences for years, uh, for many, many years, did that on the road all the time. And the networking is amazing. The people you meet and the inspiration you draw from. The information is also great too. And there's there's an online event too. If people can't travel, you can use that discount code to get 10% off there. But it will be in the show notes. And yeah, February 11th, I believe it starts. That's the opening ceremony, February 11th. But it goes from the 12th uh, all through the week, Monday through Friday. And then uh, that's it. But I hope to see some of you folks down there. All right, see you guys in the next one.